chairing of the Readiness Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee. First, some administrative and technical notes. All of us have heard this many times, but nonetheless, our general counsel says we must go ahead and do it one more time. Members are reminded that they must be visible on screen within the software platform for the purposes of identity verification. Members must continue to use the software platform's video function while attending the hearing unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render the member unable to fully participate on camera. If you experience technical difficulties, please contact the committee staff for assistance. When you are recognized, video will be broadcast via television and internet feeds. You will be recognized as normal for questions. But if you want to speak at any other time, you must seek recognition verbally. Please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Remember to unmute prior to speaking. Please be aware there's a slight lag between when you start speaking and when the camera shot switches to you. Please also remember to keep the software platform's video function on for the entirety of the time you're attending the hearing. If you leave for a short period for reasons other than joining a different proceeding, please leave your video function on. If you're leaving to join a different proceeding or will be absent for a significant period of time, you should exit the software platform entirely and then rejoin when you return. Be, please be advised that I've designated Melanie on my committee staff to be the enforcer. She will mute you if you are not muting yourself. If you attempt to speak when you're not spoken to, maybe she will unmute you. Please use the platform's chat feature only to communicate with staff regarding technical or, logistic or logistical support issues. Finally, you will see a five minute countdown clock on the software platform display. Please pay attention to it. However, I will remind you when your time is up. Next, I will now seek unanimous consent to permit a non-committee member who happens to represent one of the shipyards that we'll be discussing here. I would like to uh, seek your permission for uh, Eric, excuse me, Eric Kilmer uh, to participate without objection. So ordered. Uh, Derek, you'll be uh, last on the uh, gavel list, as you know, and I'll call on you when that time arrives. So with that out of, the, out of the way, I'd like to make a few opening remarks. Two of the most significant inhibitors of fleet readiness are delayed maintenance and out-of-date shipyard facilities. This is a high-stakes problem. As the Navy, Navy's fleet is the foundation of our global power projection, rigorous and timely maintenance means we can have more ships at sea at any given time. It's also essential to preserving our ships' availability throughout their expected service life. Unlike other platforms, major ship maintenance work is complex, enormously expensive, and takes months to complete and is relatively infrequent. As the administration contemplates a larger fleet of naval vessels, we must consider whether an already struggling shipyard enterprise has the capacity to sustain them. Unfortunately, the planning and performance of the Navy ship maintenance seems to be stuck in a cycle of delay due to optimistic assumptions in acquisition and extended deployments, deferred maintenance, and also inaccurate projections of both the duration and the cost of ship maintenance. Indeed, since 2012, two-thirds of the Navy ships and submarine maintenance availabilities have been completed late, leading to tens of thousands of lost operational and training days. I look forward to hearing about the Navy's efforts to address these problems. I understand there are several initiatives underway to improve the Navy's maintenance operations. For example, Shipyard Hiring and Modernization Plan, a new contracting strategy, and analytical efforts to better forecast maintenance needs, among others. Of these, I am most concerned about the modernization of the four public shipyards. The Navy's 20-year, $21 billion ship infrastructure optimizational plan is essential to fixing the public yards, which are all, all in poor or failing condition, with too few 
functioning dry docks and equipment well past its service life. I applaud the Navy's development of this plan, which will overhaul antiquated facilities, recapitalize equipment, and reorganize workflow to reduce wasted time. However, I want to see the details of the plan. I want to know what's going to be done in the next five years and in the 10 years, and if it goes to 20 years, the years 10 to 20. Now, Congress directed the development of this plan, and I worry that without our continuing prodding, that it will fail to come to fruition. The Navy's in the unfortunate habit of prioritizing resources for new platforms over the essential, but perhaps less glamorous, investment in facilities to sustain and the military construction necessary in our shipyards. I also worry that the projected 20 years is far too long to modernize this critical infrastructure and that the current plan leaves no margin for flexibility to accommodate a larger and reconfigured nuclear fleet. Upgrading our shipyards is one of the prerequisites for meeting the needs of tomorrow's Navy. Overhauling the way, the way the Navy performs maintenance is another. To this end, I'm particularly interested in hearing how the Navy is using sensors, algorithms, and other data-driven maintenance strategies to perform smarter, more cost-effective maintenance that will extend the life lifespans of existing ships. <clears throat> Finally, fixing fleet maintenance must also involve grappling with self-inflicted damage caused by years of misaligned priorities. For far too long, the Navy has operated at an untenable pace, sustaining the global presence it has maintained 25 years ago, it maintained 25 years ago with a much smaller fleet today. At the same time, leadership has prioritized building new ships over directing resources and management attention to maintaining the current fleet. A successful strategy must confront both the overall size of the fleet and the guarantee that the fleet can be, main, can be maintained successfully. With that, I'd like to turn to you, Mr. Wilson, who is covering for our ranking member, Doug Lamborn of Colorado, who is not with us today. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman John Garmandi. I look forward to a productive hearing today. The issues of delays and cost increases when it comes to maintaining our ship and submarine fleet is unfortunately a problem we have faced long time as a challenge to deterrence for, to provide for peace through strength. The threats we face are only becoming more complex as we confront a rising China who is building ships at a faster rate than anyone has in recent history and now has the world's largest Navy. It's more important than ever that we get to work on maintaining and repairing our fleet right correctly while also expanding it both in size and capability. Former Deputy National Security Advisor Matthew Pittenger has advised that the Chinese military buildup is the largest in peacetime in world history. This is one of the many reasons I am concerned that the budget top line re released recently by the administration fails to keep pace with inflation and cuts defense spending in terms of real dollars. Along with Chairman Garamondi, I want to see the budget details and assess our progress towards increasing maintenance cap capacity. Our four public shipyards have too few functional dry docks and are equipped with capital equipment well beyond a service life that was originally manufactured by companies that no longer exist. All of this contributed to an aircraft carrier average overage of 113 days and overdue submarine availabilities an average of 225 days. That also means 75% of the maintenance periods for aircraft carriers and submarine were completed late between FY 2015 and FY 2019. Congress directed the Navy to develop the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Plan, SIOP, in 2018 to address many of these issues. I remain very concerned that the plan only accounts for 67 of 68 of the anticipated maintenance availabilities of the current fleet. That does not account for any of the reconfiguration of the current fleet that may occur or even any unscheduled work as we recently saw with the Bonham Richard. 
we must see real investments in these yards in the year's budget. I'm not, it's not just a question of allocating the required funding, but also the resources required to support the workload planning that can provide certainty to our partners in the private shipyards. The Navy contracts with 22 certified private dry docks, but are without consistent predictable workloads and contracts, it's impossible for these yards to make the capital investments needed to support the current and future needs. I'm interested to hear how the persons testifying today are working to bring certainty to the workload planning for the private yards and increased capacity. Finally, when it comes to the workforce, we all know that these men and women are critical to maintaining these war fighting capabilities and are often operating without any room of error. Many times we see skill gaps that are not being adequately addressed. I would like to hear how you are working to increase the availability of artisans with skills, critical skills, whether in, it's partnering with trade schools or apprenticeships and how we can be supported. This lack of skilled workers has also contributed to the Navy continuing to use overtime to complete planned workload. GAO's analysis found that the high overtime among certain production shops, such as painting or welding, averaging from 25 to 25% for the fiscal years 2015 through 19, with a peak overtime as high as 45%. Core requirements indicate you should be able to get planned work done without the use of overtime to allow for surge requirements and contingencies. I'm very concerned that we lack the surge capacity in our workforce. I appreciate the continued service and experience of all of you who are here today to provide for our nation, and I look forward to the discussions today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. I'd like to welcome uh, and thank our witnesses appearing today as Vice Admiral William Delinius, Commander of Naval Sea Systems Command, Rear Admiral Eric Verhoeg, Director of the Surface Ship Maintenance and Modernization at NAVC, and Rear Admiral Howard Markle, Deputy Commander for Logistics, Maintenance, and Industrial Operations at NAVC. Uh, gentlemen, please proceed. Uh, I believe, uh, Admiral Galinius, you're going to start. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chairman Garamondi, Congressman Wilson, distinguished lawmakers, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss ship and submarine maintenance, and specifically the systemic considerations that you raised in your opening statements. I will be providing our collective opening remarks. I'd first like to thank this committee for your very solid and continued support of our Navy. It's a privilege to be with you here this afternoon to discuss fleet readiness. A top priority for the Naval Sea Systems Command is delivering combat power principally the on-time delivery of ships, submarines, and aircraft carriers out of maintenance. In support of our CNO's navigation plan and his priority on readiness, our ability to deploy combat-ready ships and submarines starts in our public and private sector shipyards and ship repair facilities around the globe. Nearly 70% of our fleet at sea today will still be in service in 2030 our ability to effectively maintain these ships and submarines is critical to delivering on the Navy our nation needs. As our fleet continues to evolve, so does our thinking and our efforts to sustain these ships and submarines that we operate, how we plan maintenance periods, how we contract for the work that we execute, opportunities to improve execution and recapitalize our Naval shipyards we continue to learn and pursue world-class performance. We've taken lessons learned and input from our fleet, from our workforce, and especially private industry in order to refine and improve our processes and procedures. Our goal is to deliver every ship and submarine out of maintenance on time, every time. And while I'm confident we're working on the right things, and the trends are absolutely moving in the right direction. I will tell you, we still have more to do, as you indicated during your initial comments. Across surface ship maintenance, where the work is done in the private sector, our Navy has evolved our contracting strategies to provide 
a better balance of the Navy's cost and schedule requirements, industry's needs for stable funding and workload, and contract award dates that allow for proper planning and material purchasing of the shipyards executing these availabilities. We've also made great strides in using the data available to us to better plan and execute this maintenance by utilizing the Navy's performance to plan analysis and expanding directed maintenance strategies and improving our availability duration and planning tool known as the Availability Duration Scorecard 3.0. This allows us to better forecast availability schedules and reduce the number of maintenance delays. As we progress with the next generation destroyer, the light amphibious warship and other new designs, we are leveraging our collective maintenance and sustainment knowledge into the design process so these ships are built with maintainers in mind. Within the four public shipyards, we have grown the size of our organic workforce, delivered on new technologies and processes that, as stated in our written testimony, have made significant headway in reducing the days of maintenance delay. The Shipyard Infrastructure and Optimiz Optimization Program, SIOP, as it is affectionately called, is absolutely foundational to the Navy's ability to execute planned submarine and aircraft carrier maintenance for the next generation of aircraft carriers and submarines. And as we complete a digital twin model for each of our four shipyards and build out each shipyard's area development plan, we will be able to design and build modern shipyards that will maximize work efficiencies and throughput and accommodate the Ford class carriers and the Virginia payload module submarines, the new Block 5s coming down the line. A newer, though no less important effort is our work to improve cost and schedule performance in our naval shipyards. This plan uses data analytics to identify availability planning and execution performance and shortfalls in areas for improvement in our four naval shipyards. As I mentioned to this committee in March, we are also utilizing the Naval Sustainment System Shipyards effort to institute significant and systemic and transformational changes across all four public shipyards to improve our planning and execution performance. Where SIOP is focused on rebuilding and modifying the shipyard's physical infrastructure, Naval Sustainment System shipyards will fundamentally change the way we operate the shipyards. From a business perspective, focusing on our production workforce, their immediate supervisors, our engineers and logisticians, to ensure that they have what they need when they need them so they can execute their tasks efficiently and not expend unnecessarily time and effort on non-value added work. Leveraging industry best practices, this effort is being executed with a collective sense of urgency to empower our people at the waterfront to either solve issues immediately or push them up the chain of command for resolution. As I mentioned when I started, ship maintenance is continually to evolve, and we look forward to the opportunities to improve across the enterprise and execute NAVC's number one priority of delivering combat power on time. Thank you again for this opportunity to spend some time with you this afternoon, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Admiral, thank you very much for the testimony and for the written testimony. The detail in the written testimony uh, is extremely helpful to us, as is your oral testimony here. Um, I'm going to pose one overarching question, and that is, you're headed in the right direction uh, on both the public and the private yards and what you are intending to do. A lot of this came from the previous NDAAs. We will, in the next three months, two months actually, complete the House version of the NDAA. What do you need in that law to not only continue what you're doing, but to advance the time frame in which these, these tasks will be done? What do you need? So, sir, what I would tell you, just to start off, um, you know, on the public sector side, and let me just start with the PSYOP effort. Um, you know, the focus on being able to accelerate the planning efforts 
um, is probably probably top of that list. And I, um, w when we talked a, a few months ago, I mentioned kind of opportunities to accelerate that plan. We're coming through the, the end stages of that effort, and, um, and we'll be ready to discuss with you here, you know, uh, in, in the very near future. But our ability to, to get the planning done up front, which includes the area development plans that talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the infrastructure, um, the, the foundational uh, environment that we want to uh, build these new buildings in, you know, that's, that's probably a key part there. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing over the next uh, several months is finishing the, uh, the digital twin models for each of the four shipyards. They'll be done by the end of this year, so that's absolutely key. Um, so so that's, that's important. On the, on the private sector side, um, I think we really do need to continue to, uh, to execute the plan that, that Admiral Verhagen and his team has laid in place um, from a contracting perspective, what they're doing with, uh, you know, bundling availabilities, uh, our material procurement plans and things of that nature to continue to, to improve on, on these efforts. So th those are kind of the near-term things that, that we need to do and, and need to get after, sir. Here's, here's what I would like to do, and uh, we'll take this up with our committee members, is that uh, I would like to have a specific plan for the next five years on each of those on the... Um, the government yards, the public yards, as to what you need to carry out that planning. And then I would like to have a report back. Uh, well, we'll call you back in the, within the next six months to get a report, but we're going to write into the NDAA certain time frames in which we expect you to uh, achieve goals that will put in place the PSYOPs for the public yards. So we're going to work together with uh, our staff will work with you over the next uh, month as we prepare. And it's going to be step by step and a date associated with each step and the money that's necessary to carry out those steps. Does that fit with what you can you carry that out? Can you do that? Well, it's a, it, absolutely, yes, sir. We're we're ready to provide that. We we can we can have that for you, yes, sir. Very good. Uh, I'm going to uh, let my I'm going to end my questions there. I would hope one of our members takes up the uh, uh, public yards. Excuse me, the, the private the private yards and the and uh, Admiral Rehag's work on that. Joe, it's your turn. Joe Wilson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, for Admiral Galenas, uh, as you indicated, and this is in line with what the chairman just mentioned, uh, the stability of the nation's of the Navy's maintenance industrial base is an important consideration in the context of great power competition. Commercial providers that support the Navy typically require special skills, facilities, and certifications, which limit the ability of the place work at a new commercial provider on a short notice. How? Would you assess the industry's ability to handle fluctuations in work and accommodate future modernization efforts? Yes, sir. Let me. I just want to make sure I understand the question. Um, this was private industry's ability to handle future yes. work. So we may be. Yes, yes sir. With, with the stability that you mentioned. So. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I would tell you right now. Um, you know, I, I think the, the the shipyards that we have uh, um, are able to handle the work that we we currently have. Um, one of the uh, the ongoing discussions I'll say that we're having right now is as we you know potentially look to to possibly grow the fleet. What additional capability or capacity might we need to bring online? Okay, um, and and so you know when I when I think through that on the private sector side. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask Admiral Verhaeg to uh, to provide his comments on this. Uh, but you know, where can we bring on additional capacity? Okay, um, you know, we've seen examples of that on the West Coast as of late, uh, where we've had uh, you know a, a couple of new shipyards uh, come into into play. Uh, we've seen that in Pearl Harbor, where we had one ship uh, repair provider you know leave uh, leave the island. And, uh, and a couple of other com companies step up and come into that. Um, there are also a number of smaller shipyards 
uh, out there that I, I don't think we've, we're fully utilized. So there, there is some of that capacity that, that's out there. Uh, the other part of this is, is some of the smaller companies uh, that really support these, these larger ship repair yards. So these are the subcontractors that provide uh, very specific services, uh, whether they be mechanical or electrical, or even support services in terms of, uh, you know, things like staging and, and, uh, and, and coding applications, things of that nature. Um, so that's, that's a part of the of industry that we, we really need to, uh, to continue to focus on, and, and we'll, we'll continue to, to, uh, uh, to, to look at that. Uh, another, another element of this would be, uh, you know, opportunities for, uh, for CapEx, and, uh, and I think that's something we need to, to continue to look at for some of, the, uh, some of our, our private industries. I would tell you, on the, on the, the current contracting strategy and fixed price, uh, you know, frankly, that is probably more difficult for industry to find a CapEx money to, uh, to provide there. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop, sir, and, and ask Admiral Verhaeg if he uh, has any additional comments, sir. Congressman Wilson, thank you for that question, sir. Uh, I do agree we're headed in the right direction. There's more work to do. And, and, and both industry and, and the Navy uh, need to, to, do, to do more. Um, I do think we're heading on, on the right trajectory, as you said. Um, uh, two parts kind of would be my answer to this. One is we need to maximize our productivity for each day that a ship is in the yard. So we need to do better with the capacity uh, that we have. And both industry and the government, uh, Navy, has a part in that. And so things like awarding earlier to allow better planning, um, speeding our decision making whenever there is uh, growth or new work, um, you know, providing all the long lead material ahead of times, those are all things that the government is doing collaboratively with industry. On the industry side, they're focused on schedule management, kind of investing in their trades, um, um, and, and exploring ways to expand c capacity. I think. The second piece on expanding capacity, I would like to see a CapEx-like approach, um, things focused on training, things focused on maybe um, uh, dredging uh, or expanding uh, dry dock capacity. Those things will give us um, some flexibility and uh, surge capacity, um, you know, both during um, kind of normal operations and, and, and more in a kind of emergency situation. So. Um, a great partnership ongoing right now with um, Hampton Roads uh, Maritime Consortium. It's the state, the federal, the local, uh, Old Dominion University, all of us working together on how best to position um, our collective ship repair uh, base for um, long-term success. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. A couple of things come to mind from that discussion, and thank you for raising that set of issues, uh, Mr. Wilson. The uh, talked about capitalization. There's the small shipyard uh, program in the Marad over in the uh, TNI committee. Uh, we need to uh, look at that specifically. I know that uh, the old uh, the old program uh, at Mare Island uh, in San Francisco Bay. They have a very large dry dock that is not operable right now, but with a certain amount of capital expenditure that could be, and then they could bid uh, for the repair of uh, naval ships. I know that's not unique. I know that is repeated around the nation. And so as we look at this uh, in a holistic way, we need to also bring Marad into it so that the uh, privately owned docks, not just the big ones that we know so much about, but some of the others that are out there that can take on some of the smaller uh, jobs could be made available uh, to the Navy, providing more competition and uh, perhaps, hopefully, better readiness. Uh, Admiral Verhagen, we'd like to work with you on that. Any I, any suggestions you have, we take that over to uh, Salute Carbajal as the chairman of that subcommittee. We'll work with him. Here is the uh, gavel order. Uh, for uh, the next uh, three people, Golden, Scott, Luria. So, Mr. Golden, your turn. Thank you, Chairman Garamendi. Uh, 
I'm going to ask Vice Admiral uh, Galinas uh, a question here. Admiral, the, the Congress, uh, as you are aware, is having a conversation about investing in critical infrastructure for the entire nation, not just you know, from a DOD perspective and a national security perspective, but, but across the board, our, our nation's uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, looking at the Navy's uh, shipyard infrastructure optimization plan, I know it's, it's 20 years, about a $21 billion effort to recapitalize the public shipyards. Do you have an estimate, does the Navy has an estimate for what type of investment is necessary for the private yards as well in order to best uh, meet the needs of the Navy's maintenance schedule? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we we do, and and you know we've been working with uh, with a couple of the private yards uh, and where we would potentially make some of that investment. Um, there are things such as uh, you know potential uh, uh, I'll say dredging projects that that would help uh, in one port. Um, you know the addition of, of maybe a, uh, a a ship lift system. Um, to, to better utilize the capacity within the shipyard, uh, maybe another project. Okay, um, I think as, as Admiral Verhaig, uh, you know, talked about the uh, development of the workforce is, is always, uh, you know, high on my list anyway in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring that we have a, a, a well qualified and trained workforce. Uh, so, so those are a couple of, uh, I'll say, projects, you know, that, that we have kind of shovel ready type uh, type efforts, if you will. Uh, you know, so, so there's there's some of that out there, and you know we certainly have um, we get we get a lot of input from industry in this as well, and you know if uh, if that opportunity were to present itself, sir, um, I, I feel pretty confident we could provide a, a pretty good uh, uh, detailed list, uh, you know, in, in relatively short order. Over. Uh, thank you, Admiral. And, and you know, I, I hope the chairman would would be interested in looking at some of those numbers as well. I mean, there's no doubt that this is critical infrastructure. Uh, there's also no doubt you know, that it would be a, a big help to the Navy uh, and, and important to our national security. But uh, you know, that work needs to be done uh, if we're able to accelerate it. I'm sure that's also going to be supporting uh, some good good jobs uh, in developing, in, as you said, uh, Admiral, and important skills uh, which we need in general uh, in our shipbuilding workforce. So I think it's something worth looking at in, in the context of, of the American Jobs Plan, uh, uh, Chairman Garamendi. Uh, just, I don't know what the actual cost would be, uh, but uh, certainly very important. Uh, wh while we're talking about it, wh what other ways do you see um, public-private shipyard partnerships being able to help the Navy speed up uh, the effort to get uh, uh, a reduction in, in the schedule uh, backlog and, and maintenance delays going forward. Yes, sir. So, it, you know, one of the things we're working right now, um, an example, we have a couple of submarines, as you know, uh, in one of our private sector shipyards. That we're working closely with them um, to, to provide some, uh, uh, you know, lessons learned from how we finish uh, 688 submarines and how we certify the submarines for sea. Uh, we're working uh, with them on, on sub-safe qualifications. Uh, you know, we, we've also uh, started a partnership uh, with, with the yards on, uh, on, on welding and NDT processes, okay, uh, which, which are key to, to any ship repair or new construction uh, effort, as you well know. And um, so, so those, are, those are a couple of, you know, kind of specific things that we're working with, with them on. Um, you know, and I'll go back on the... Uh, uh, you know, back on the workforce, if I could, for just one second. And, uh, you know, Admiral Verhaeg mentioned the, uh, the effort ongoing down in, down in Hampton Roads. But, you know, we're seeing in the, in the new construction world, every new construction shipyard really does have a, I'll say, a pretty good apprentice program. Um, and we need to kind of leverage some of the work that has been done, you know, in there, you know, up in the, up in the northeast there or, or on, the, on the Gulf Coast or, you know, there, there's good apprenticeship programs out there. We've got good apprenticeship programs in our in our public shipyards as well, teaming with community college colleges, as I mentioned during our, our, our last discussion here back in March. Um, but I think you know being able to kind of expand that more into the private sector and not just the private repair yards, but even down to some of those subcontractors that I mentioned to uh, to kind of work in that area as well. So I, I would offer that as another area we could certainly uh, you know kind of advance the partnership a little bit over. 
I see I'm out of time, Chairman. Uh, I, I appreciate that last bit there, uh, Admiral. Uh, and I, I'll let you know I'm, I'm actually working right now with uh, Bath Ironworks in Maine and our community college system in Maine to uh, get some uh, mobile uh, welding opportunities out there to, um, you know, apprenticeship style programs yes, uh, so we can get even more people uh, trained up quickly to, to hire at that yard, which I know you're familiar with. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Golden. Uh, the program that you're working with in uh, in Maine, could you please uh, develop that information, get it to the committee? And we may want to, we do want to spread that kind of uh, activity around and so that, uh, you know, Maine is good, but there are other places that need to have the uh, wisdom of the far Northeast. Thank be you. more than happy to, um, to share that. One of the things that we're going to need to do here uh, as this hearing continues uh, is to circle back. Our committee schedule is full, the formal committees. Uh, I am, after just 36 minutes of this hearing, uh, of the opinion that I would need to pull together an informal roundtable uh, with the private uh, with, with the admirals, the private shipyard, the government shipyards, and the private shipyards uh, to discuss this, uh, the good and the bad and what needs to be done. We really need to hear from the uh, private companies uh, as uh, the issues they have uh, with the Navy and what they need. The infrastructure issue that you raised, Mr. Golden, is a fascinating one to include in the infrastructure bill uh, shipyards. We've certainly talked about dredging, but I don't believe we talked specifically about funding uh, not only the military, but the private shipyards. Very good. Okay, our next uh, witness, our next uh, presenter is uh, Austin Scott. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Admirals. I am, uh, I'm landlocked here in South Georgia, but I represent Robbins Air Force Base. And one of the key things to us as we talk about um, the air logistics complex is is that the Air Force has been very public about the the fact that they cannot operate with any less than three depots. Uh, and that obviously gives uh, some comfort to the contractors around the base and industry that builds up around the base that the base is gonna continue to be there in the future. Uh, could the Navy survive with less than four, uh, the four shipyards that you currently have? Uh, we could not survive with less than four, no, sir. I, I will tell you that. Um, you know, in fact, one of the, the efforts that we're going through right now is actually to uh, expand the productive capacity of our yards. I mean, it, as you know, sir, back uh, you know in, in the late uh, the late part of the last the last century in the '90s, there we we had eight public yes, shipyards sir. in operation, and we and we necked down to four. Um, we absolutely can go no lower, no, sir. Admiral, that's the point that I was about to make is that in 96 and 97, we closed 50% of the public shipyards uh, that our that our nation depended on for uh, our naval operations, which is which is obviously probably the most important aspect of our national security. Uh, and, you know, I think it would I think it would be worth the Navy considering making a very public statement as the Air Force has. That the that the United States Navy has a position that there will be no less than four public shipyards, uh, and I would encourage you to consider that. Just as the Air Force has made it uh, clear that there will be no less than than three depots, I think it would uh, um, certainly help you as as time goes 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 on with regard to the the people wanting to build around around the bases with infrastructure that that supports you uh, and other things. So, uh, have you, uh, you talk about on five and six about best practices and improving planning. Uh, as I said, I spend more time with the Air Force than the Navy, but do you meet with your colleagues in the Air Force uh, at, the, at the senior level to, to collaborate about best practices? And if you have been able to share uh, across the different branches, those best practices? Uh, yes, sir. Um... I can't say I have, I have personally met with, with folks in the Air Force on this. Um, you know, we um, kind of what we do in the, in, in the shipyards and, and in ship repair, 
um, you know, there are opportunities occasionally to get together with other services, but uh, I can't say that I have specifically talked to them about um, about what we're doing. But let me uh, let me turn this over to uh, to Admiral Markle, uh, and I think he can give you a little bit better uh, answer here, sir. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Appreciate the question and the opportunity to talk about our partnerships with the, the, our sister services. So, um, the Department of Defense as a whole um, brings us all together across the services, uh, and in particular the depot maintenance communities, uh, to share um, our lessons learned, um, our uh, struggles, our challenges, um, which, as you can imagine, are similar to one another, and talk about how it is that we're navigating those particular areas as we move forward. Um, we do that uh, not only with, uh, you know, the, the depots are different, but uh, they even in, at times have different funding. Some are maybe working capital, some are sure. mission funding, but they all share the same thing in that uh, they see challenges with um, uh, development of their workforce, uh, the partnerships with the private sector, um, the maintenance of their facilities, um, et cetera, and we all learn from one another in those forums. Um, uh, of what we're doing to, uh, in fact, work on those individual pieces. Like we've shared our PSYOP uh, discussion with uh, other services as well. Over. Sure. And I, I know that, you know, there's a lot of difference in a ship in, in, in an airplane, but when it comes to the software and some of the other types of uh, onboard systems, if you will, uh, there's a there's a program in, in Georgia called Project Synergy that's a collaboration between the uh, private sector and the public sector in, in software development. And uh, that would be one that I would suggest might be worth taking a look at because but I, I know it's different from a construction standpoint, but some of the software development and other things, I do think there's some opportunities there. Um, one other one other thing, um, well, I'm, I'm down 10 seconds. So let me thank you for your time. I mean, if we have another round of questions, I'll ask, I'll ask those questions then, but I yield the five seconds, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, we will almost certainly have a second round of questions. Uh, we now have uh, Ms. Lurie. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Admiral Galinas, um, in a March 2021 Congressional Budget Office report, the CBO compares the class maintenance plan expectation of days in the shipyard and days of labor to the scheduled and actual amounts for the extended dry docking selective restricted availability or EDSRA of the first five Virginia class submarines. And on table uh, on page 12 of the report shows that the class maintenance plan for the EDSRA was, should have been 450 days and 203,000 labor days. However, the scheduled days for four of these five availabilities far exceeds the class plan. And furthermore, the actual days it took to complete these availabilities exceeds the class plan by an average of nearly 70% across the five availabilities, which resulted in a loss of 1,552 days of operational time. And over the nine year period when these availabilities occurred, so the first five Virginia class submarines, the Navy lost four and a quarter years of operational availability of those submarines. Then in May of 2019, the Navy changed the Virginia class maintenance plan to increase the duration of the EDSRA from 450 to 590 days, which was a 31% increase. Even though historically at that point, these EDSRAs have been taking about 760 days. Um, and you know, additionally, the, the Virginia class submarine, um, its design was expected to have 22% fewer days of labor on average than the Los Angeles class. Yet the data described in the CBO report shows that the actual labor days were labor days were 43% higher. I was curious, what organization developed the Virginia class class maintenance plan? Yeah, so uh, ma'am, thanks. That, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, it's it's something that uh, we've had a lot of discussion uh, on mm -hmm. with, within our, our team here, because it's, uh, you know, you spoke specifically very eloquently about the Virginia class uh, submarines that we're, but we're seeing, um, you know, similar trends on the 688s where we're doing a lot more work. Yeah, so uh, Admiral, I, I hate to cut you off, but I have limited time on my question. I just wanted to get through a few separate parts sure. of it. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's our submarine maintenance and engineering um, team that does that. Uh, they're located up at uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire shipyard. Okay, and so why would you assess that the class maintenance plan was so far off from the actual uh, time and man days it took to do the maintenance when it was actually executed 
at a, at a, at a very high level, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, replacements and, and system repair work that's required um, inside of the planned uh, service life of that particular component or system. Uh, and then we couple that with some challenges, uh, in material challenges in, in getting parts and, uh, uh, and whatnot for the, for the submarine. So it's really systems not lasting to their service life and then in spare parts. Okay, so Admiral, you know, when I look at this kind of data, what it, what it says to me um, is that the Navy hasn't accurately estimated the maintenance requirements. And it's one of the many reasons that I think that the Navy has a credibility problem when you, you come to us. Um, and, you know, you combine that with grossly underestimated cost estimates for new construction and timelines for project completion. Um, you know, I think misplaced faith in new technologies that aren't fully developed and then an inability um, to deliver promised capabilities. Um, I wanted to shift to a statement you made about submarines in um, your uh, your remarks. Um, so you said that Portsmouth Naval Shipyard undocked the USS California SSN 781 ahead of schedule and completed its follow-on steam program milestones five days early. Is this the same way of saying the availability finished early or is this mean something else? No, ma'am. So to, to be specific on that, um, you know, last June we reset for all availabilities that were in execution, uh, we reset the completion dates uh, because of the pandemic. Um, on California specifically, uh, and this is through targeted use of overtime, uh, the use of the reserve, the surge main force that we have, um, and, and just really the work by the shipyard, uh, we were able to actually beat the schedule that we set for ourselves last June. So, you know, that that early undocking and the early delivery was really to the reprogrammed uh, schedule. Okay, I understand the impacts of COVID. Um, so, with my colleagues, we've been discussing um, the size of the fleet that we need in the future. And if the assumptions that we use in the analysis and making those decisions, such as the time required in maintenance, are not correct, then the size of the fleet uh, that we determine we need can also not be correct. Um, and as we start to build the new Columbia class and the Constellation class, um, you know, I hope that the Navy has plans in place to be able to better estimate the maintenance requirements for these new classes. Yes, ma'am. In fact, that is one of the efforts that we're working on right now is there is a, I'll say, a, a new avail duration model for the public sector availabilities that we're doing. Um, we just finished that work uh, last month. I talked last time about the 15 year public sector maintenance plan. That model, that availability duration model is foundational to that plan. Um, we're just coming through some final testing and validation of that model, um, but I think that will give us a much better and a more accurate picture of the duration of these availabilities. Well, thank you, Admiral. I look forward to learning more about that. And I know my time has expired, but I just wanted to highlight that what I, I see in this data is that maintenance delays are significantly impacting the operational availability of our ships and submarines. And uh, like many have said today, the investments in the public and private shipyards and in that workforce actually increase the effective size of the fleet. Um, so the investment in this infrastructure is needed today and not 20 years from now. So thank you and I yield back. Absolutely agree. Yes, thank you, Ms. Lurie. Uh, we are gonna do a second round of questions and uh, you can certainly expand on that point, which is a very, very good one. Um, Mr. Kilmer, welcome, delighted to have you. and. Uh, exactly do you represent in Washington? I represent the 6th district, which includes uh, Naval Base Kitsap, uh, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. And uh, thank you, Chairman, for inviting me to sit in. I appreciate it. And uh, Admiral Markle, it's good to see you. We miss you out in Kitsap. Um, as, a, uh, as a former member of this committee too, it's just always good to be back. Admiral Galinas, I, let me start by just saying thanks. It was good to see you uh, out at, uh, at, at Puget just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I am relieved to see the Navy recognizing the need to update and modernize our shipyards through the PSYOP. I am concerned though, that given the 20 year project lifespan of the PSYOP, that the $21 billion needed to complete these upgrades may be at, one point or another allocated to other priorities. I guess I'm less concerned about PSYOP being crowded out by other forecasted priorities, like the Ford class carriers or Columbia and Virginia class subs, which I support. 
I guess I'm more concerned about unforeseen budgetary priorities that could arise over the next 20 years. Uh, specifically, I'm worried about the impacts of things like natural disasters, um, uh, which um, we've seen more frequent and severe hurricanes and other catastrophic events like earthquakes. Even within the past few years, we've seen natural disasters impacting the Navy's planned budgetary spending, the funding required to repair damages from the earthquake at China Lake and the uh, impacts of Hurricane Sally in the Pensacola area are two prime example. I know those disasters alone have cost the Navy upwards of a billion dollars and that spending is cut into other planned priorities. So my concern is that unforeseen spending, however necessary, could delay the PSYOP uh, and that has, as we've discussed over the course of the last 50 minutes, that could have disastrous consequences for the Navy's ability to respond to the threats of the present and the future. So, um, one, I'd love to hear your guarantee that the Navy will continue to prioritize the PSYOP, even as future spending needs expected and unexpected arise. But what can Congress do to, to maintain focus on PSYOP to invest in the much needed upgrades at our public shipyards? If if money is not allocated to backfill unforeseen, unforeseen spending, what's the Navy's strategy to prevent unexpected missions from drawing funding away and resources away from the PSYOP? Yeah, uh, Congressman Kilmer, uh, hey, good to see you again, sir, and thanks for your time when, uh, when we were up in Puget there a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, the, the, the budget always gets a vote. I, I think um, the way I would answer your question, I, I'd go back to the uh, – uh, to the request that uh, the chairman, Chairman Garamundi, uh, you know, asked initially when we opened this is, is kind of that, that five-year plan. And, and for us to kind of lay out, you know, I'll, I'll say in a, in a fair amount of detail what our, what our plan is, and, and, and we have that. And, uh, you know, we, um, I'll just tell you, within the last, uh, you know, month, six weeks or so, we, we now have the, the, the full program office in place, um, and they've been, they've been really kind of getting after the acquisition strategy and the details of the plan that the chairman asked for. But uh, I'll also kind of ask Admiral Markle to provide his comments on this as well, sir. Hey, Congressman, great to see you again. Um, absolutely look back fondly on our time together up in the PAC Northwest. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of answer with the, 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 the entry into the discussion of uh, uh, greatly appreciate your, your support then uh, continue to appreciate your support now of both the PAC Door West and broader on the on the committees that you uh, you serve on. Um, it truly is uh, one thing you can do is the continued advocacy and support of us. Um, always a, a help uh, when we have our uh, congressionals on the on uh, behind us on uh, what we need in order to be successful, um, whether that's through legislation or whether that's through um, you know advocating for it on the in the various ways that you uh, engage uh, across the spectrum. So um, I, I will tell you that just simplistically, uh, just to build upon the Admiral's comments, not, not only do we owe you a plan and a discussion of the plan, um, we owe that to the broader Navy, and, uh, and then from there, uh, obviously looking for your support as uh, we move out on it. Let me ask quickly, the, the, I know, and even today, we've heard some discussion around potentially accelerating the, the work. Um, you know, obviously moving things left, reduce the risk of, of, of SAP getting crowded out. I also know it's a logistical challenge. This is a heck of a game of Jenga because you're trying to modernize the shipyards while they still have to work. Um, if your evaluation determines that aspects of SIOP can be accelerated, do you expect additional funding will be needed? Uh, so, uh, as you look at the potential for acceleration, there's obviously two very large constraints that would, uh, that would constrain that. And, and those are uh, funding, and those are the ability to uh, to accelerate those and integrate them with the ongoing maintenance, ensuring that we could be, may, may meet our mission. Um, opportunities certainly could exist as we continue to study PSYOP and perform our analysis on those mega products, projects. Um, clearly, we're focused on the docks up front. You can see that in the previous president's budget, and you will likely see further uh, commitment to, to that. Um, but as we look to the broader uh, optimization piece and those things that support that, those are certainly areas of opportunity for us to accelerate integrating with the overall mission execution. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. That you might have. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm driving so hard for a five year, what are we going to do next year or and the year after that and the, and the next three years beyond 
is, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, last week, several billion dollars was returned to the Department of Defense for military construction programs. To my knowledge, none of that will be available for this particular purpose because none of the programs that we've been talking about, none of the uh, activities we've been talking about here are yet in the uh, military construction MILCON program. They're not programmed. So I'm going to drive very hard, uh, Admiral Galinius, you know this, uh, for uh, detail uh, for the next five years so that we can every year know what you need. And then, Mr. Kilmer, we become the problem, not the Navy. And uh, so we can, uh, you know, begin to discipline ourselves. Uh, Okay, um, I want to go to a piece here that uh, we've talked about, uh, and that is uh, that the repair of a ship when it arrives at the dock, is there satisfactory and sufficient information on what needs to be done on that ship? Uh, some call this uh, analytics, data analytics. I call it big data. Uh, but it seems to me that we now have the... Uh, uh, the necessary tools to have a much better understanding of what a ship will need when it gets to the dock long before it arrives so that the parts and pieces and spares and uh, drive shafts and other equipment uh, will be there when the ship arrives rather than, and this takes us to the delay that the delays that Ms. Luria talked about. It seems as though most of those delays are caused by Gee, we didn't know we needed this piece until the ship arrived. So, Admiral, uh, whichever one of you wants to take it, make me really happy and tell me that you're doing data analytics, that you're getting ahead of it, that you're data mining, and that when that ship arrives, uh, you know 99% of what will be needed when it gets to the dock. Admiral, yes, sir. Linus, yes, you yes sir. Start? Me, I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to my, my colleagues here. Um, but I would tell you, um, the answer is yes, we're using data analytics in both uh, the public and the private sector side. And, you know, foundationally, it all starts with the class maintenance plan. And as Congressman Lurie pointed out, you know, in, in, <clears throat> in some cases, you know, we've got work to do on the class maintenance plan. Um, the second part of this is the assessments that we do and the tests that we do on the ships and the submarines before we get them into the yard to get a better understanding of the uh, uh, of the condition of the ship. And, and one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is we've driven more discipline into that process. There's a clear understanding by the fleet that that needs to be done, that they need to allocate the time for the ship or the submarine to be able to do those tests. And so that's an important piece. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Admiral Verhagen. and he can talk a little bit on the private sector side and then uh, Admiral Markle. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that question. Uh, Congresswoman Loria, came over to our war room uh, and spent uh, very graciously spent two hours with us and got to see, I think, in person kind of our passion for data and for analytics and using it to drive or to inform our thinking and more importantly drive our actions. Um, and uh, we've expanded our partnership uh, on that effort to include with the Office of Naval Research, a number of universities, and uh, of course already had Center for Naval Analyses and Naval Surface Warfare Center Corona, um, who leads our Navy's analytics across uh, for NAVC. Um, one quick vignette, which I think hopefully will um, give you confidence. So just this week, we have a ship that was getting ready for um, about a 60-day mission, and uh, she had a problem with one of her gas turbine engines, um, or gas turbine generator. Uh, we were able to take the data uh, off that ship, send it to our in-service engineering agent in Naval Surface Warfare Center, Philly, Philadelphia. They analyzed the data and provided that information back to our regional maintenance center and allowed us to target the technicians we needed to put on that ship to get to make the effective repairs. And so what would have taken quite a long time um, was um, we were able to speed that up and compress it because of the use of that, what we call ICAST data and, 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 uh, and the digital twin that we had at Philadelphia. So that's a, that's a combined initiative uh, with NAVC-05, our chief engineer, our warfare centers, and, uh, and C-21 and our RMC. So that's a good example. Uh, we got more to do 
but that's a good example where we're using data to inform our thinking and, uh, and get more operational availability out of our platform. So that ship is sailing today uh, for the Mediterranean uh, with repairs completed quicker than they otherwise would have because of data. Over. Uh, yes, sir, building upon that and not repeating anything that's been said, uh, just a couple of thoughts. We talked about the performance to plan initiative that we have that takes the totality of the data that we have, uh, get some uh, data scientists uh, involved, uh, provides us the analytics to both uh, to the what's been discussed, take a look at uh, how better to uh, project what it is that we need in order to uh, estimate cost and schedule for the availabilities. It provides us the focus areas that we need to work on down to the individual levels. It provides us a better understanding of what components need to be repaired when. Um, and then things uh, like uh, Admiral Verhaig talked about, looking at uh, things like vibration analysis that gives us uh, indications of what we need to work on and when. And then just to take a slightly different uh, uh, look at uh, what large data can do for us, uh, doing things such as 3D scanning of and modeling of the halls themselves uh, provides us an opportunity to uh, help our folks train um, on realistic uh, conditions of what the specific uh, configurations of the ship are and provides us a better planning tool such that we can write more accurate paper uh, ahead of the availability to prepare for those upcoming assessments. Over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will be following this uh, data trail very, very closely and uh, frankly demanding that you not only do what you're doing, but you do more of what you're presently doing. Uh, with regard to the uh, gavel order, uh, Wilson, Golden, Scott. So, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, you're right. Thank you Chairman Garamundi and <clears throat> Admirals. I uh, am particularly impressed by uh, your presentations. Uh, and I also want you to be aware that I'm a very uh, grateful and proud Navy dad. I have a, a son who's a, a orthopedic surgeon in the Navy, and uh, it just is inspiring to me to see the leadership of our Navy. And uh, I look forward to joining with Chairman Garamondi to work with you. Uh, and uh, Admiral Berhage, what are you doing to prepare for the maintenance requirements of a growing and modernizing fleet? Does the $21 billion shipyard infrastructure optimization plan account for forecasted maintenance needs for an expanded fleet? Congressman, uh, Congressman uh, Wilson, thank you for that question. Um, uh, two, two strategies for that. Um, uh, one is, uh, as we talked a little bit earlier, make the maximum use of the capacity that we have today. And there are improvements needed on both the government side and the industry side uh, to, to get to where we want to be. One of the best things to do is to give industry a stable and predictable demand signal. Um, and when they have that, then they can make uh, wise investment choices to improve their uh, performance. We um, are awarding our contracts earlier uh, than we used to. Um, as we speak, our average uh, uh, days prior to the start of the avail that we've ordered, we've awarded our contracts this year is 123 days prior which is, uh, I think, a magnificent uh, improvement. We're also adding a second ship sometimes, which we call a horizontal bundle, and that is to provide certainty to the company that wins that second ship two in a row, but also allows others that didn't win that, uh, um, that contract some certainty as well to inform uh, their planning. So, so better demand, uh, level loading our ports, making better use of the capacity we have, and we each have a part, and then we talked earlier about CAPEX-like or the MARAD grant, which I have uh, read up on. You know, those types of things, I think, could be useful um, uh, as we work to uh, be able to support properly a larger fleet. Thank you very much for that insight. And uh, Admiral Merkel, uh, a 2019 GAO report found that since 2014, Navy ships spent more than 33,700 more days and maintenance and expected as a result of insufficient shipyard capacity and a shortage of skilled workers. What metrics does the Navy use to measure progress toward growing more shipyard capacity? Yes, sir, I appreciate the comment and appreciate the opportunity to discuss our, uh, our 
our need to balance the workload, the workforce, and the partnering that obviously is necessary there with the private sector. So we often, often look to Admiral Verhaeg uh, to talk about the private sector. And of course, uh, as I execute my workload um, and we look to, to uh, find the right levers to um, execute it, clearly there's a partnership to be had in the individual ports with the private sector, whether that's uh, on uh, larger avails, as Admiral Galinas discussed earlier, in contracting them out to the uh, electric boats and Newport News shipbuildings of the world, or it's the, the uh, discrete contracting that I do for preservation work and uh, other items on uh, the major availabilities, utilizing some of the same uh, private partners that uh, Admiral Verhey has. Um, as we look to what Admiral Galinas talked about with our 15-year maintenance plan, it is, in fact, just that taking a look at uh, historical data, uh, taking a look at the demand signals of the future, and coming up with an articulation of both what we need to do within the public sector and what we need to develop within the private sector with our partners in order to execute that workload. And um, finally, for uh, Admiral Galenas, um, how has the Navy been performing with respect to the reducing the idle time for submarines? Yeah, I, I would tell you, Congressman, we still have work to do in that area, frankly, okay? Um, while we are seeing a, a downward trend in the days, maintenance, days of maintenance delay, um, we really have not um, put much of a dent into the, the idle time, which is, as you well know, you know, is, is the, the time from the certification expiration date of the submarine before it enters the, the maintenance availability. So, again, the throughput of the... Uh, of the submarines through their maintenance period uh, needs to improve. This gets back in a little bit to uh, Congresswoman Luria's comments about the class maintenance plan and the work that we're doing being so much higher than what's in the class maintenance plan, sir. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. I believe it's Mr. Mr. Golden, you're next. Thank you, Chairman Garamendi. Um, you know, I, I would say quickly, you were, you were asking for details in, uh, on, on apprenticeships and training that goes on in, in the Northeast, and I can speak to Maine, and, and my staff will be following up uh, with yours and, and the subcommittees on some details. But, you know, the, as Bath Iron works specifically in, in Maine, is working to grow their workforce. Uh, they are building the destroyers, as you know, uh, sir. They are uh, looking at accelerated uh, training programs uh, to bring in new uh, unskilled workers, get them the skills they need to get a foot in the, inside the yard. The union's really working with the company uh, to look at the continued ongoing training opportunity from there. Uh, but there's also, uh, you know, a, a deeper relationship as well with Maine Maritime Academy where, uh, you know, a, a, a true more traditional apprenticeship program as well, uh, which is important, I think, when you're looking at, at the, uh, the career opportunity. Uh, for a young man or woman wanting to get into the uh, shipbuilding trade. But uh, Admiral Galinas, I wanted to ask one thing that you've, we've seen at Bath Iron Works, certainly other private yards with uh, fluctuations of where, where we see increases and decreases in the shipyard workflow schedule uh, can lead to uh, issues, uh, which I, I know you're familiar with the term, the bathtub effect, uh, where we end up with uh, you know an older uh, workforce that is uh, you know, looking to retire, moving on, uh, and, and then a very young workforce that's excel uh, the yard accelerates and is growing, uh, and, and they're lacking that kind of middle uh, experience group uh, can cause a lot of problems. Uh, and, it, you know, I think certainly a big concern uh, at a lot of private yards. Are, are, you, are you seeing similar uh, outcomes and effects at public uh, shipyards uh, with their workforce? And if so, do you have any recommendations on how to utilize training and other methods to maintain the skilled workforce at our public shipyards. Um, yes, sir, we, we are seeing that. And, um, and I'll ask Admiral Markle to talk about the training strategy that we, he's put in place in the public shipyards. Um, but we are seeing that. And if you look at the demographics in the public shipyards um, and go back, you know, I'll say 10 years or so, um, you know, the average uh, experience uh, of, of our mechanics in the yards at that point was in the 14 to 15 year point, okay? If you looked at that same metric today, it's down to about uh, seven to eight years. So, you know, you kind of see that that delta in the experience, okay, uh, of, of the trade. So, so we're absolutely seeing that. 
And I will tell you from my experience, having worked with both the, uh, you know, the public and the private sector side, that that's a common trait, as you indicated, sir, across, you know, both public and private yards. And I would say both in repair as well as new construction. And so I'll ask uh, Admiral Markle to kind of talk about what he's doing in training on the public side. Yes, sir, thank you. I, I appreciate the question, Congressman. So uh, just like you talked about, so uh, it's, it's providing the opportunities for the future artisans to uh, enter the workforce and provide them uh, growth opportunities, uh, whether that's through a high school work study program where you provide some level of um, initial understanding and um, opportunity for the folks to enter the shipyard and understand what the trades are, further developing it into an apprenticeship program, um, to your point, partnering with uh, the local community college that can ultimately provide them uh, alongside their trade skills, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the college skills necessary to work on both their associate's degree when they graduate from the apprenticeship program and then leveraging to build upon that um, later on as they develop into baccalaureate and wherever they may go. Um, to the question on training, of course, it, you know, the apprenticeship program is wonderful and it's a great opportunity to develop someone into a journeyman, but of course everyone needs uh, work along the way in order to make sure that their golf game stays the way they want it to be. Um, so uh, taking and uh, providing just-in-time training when needed in order to continue the development of those uh, folks to make sure that their experience level is where they need, need to be and to perform the way we expect them to be out the waterfront is incredibly important. That same program, of course, is what we utilize to get people faster to decollate and reduce our uh, time to train folks by upwards of, uh, on average, of 50% and takes it from uh, one to two years to getting people on the deck plate to one to four months. Thank you for, to both of you for that. I think it's helpful uh, background for the committee. Appreciate it very much. Sure. Mr. Goldman, I believe your time has expired. Thank you very much. Mr. Scott, you're next. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Scott, before you go, uh, I'm going to go Scott, Lurie. I noticed that uh, Mr. Kalehi was uh, here earlier. I don't know if he's still on. If he is still on, he will come after you, Mr. Scott. Otherwise, it would be Ms. Lurie. Go ahead, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And mo most of my questions revolved around the, the 21 billion over, over 20 years, and certainly 21 billion is a lot of money, but when it's spread over 20 years and uh, over the course of the magnitude of the shipyards that we have, you know, just, just the same questions that other members had about, you know, the the money ended up going to other places and whether or not uh, it, it was gonna be enough to, to uh, put us in a position we need to be to service the fleet. So I'll, I'll skip that and move to kind of a, a Russia, China type question, if you will. Uh, are our investments in our shipyards keeping pace with what we're seeing from um, our, our peer competitors in China and Russia, or are they doing a better job of with their with their infrastructure for the maintenance of their fleets than we are? No, sir, I would have to tell you at this point, I think the yards in China are probably more advanced than what we have in the U.S., at least certainly in the public sector side right now. How far ahead of us are they, and and when did they pass us? Well, they they have, uh, they have long had uh, much more shipbuilding capacity than, than we have just with the number of shipyards. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. We can certainly provide those. Um, but but they've had a large number of shipyards and we have for, for some time now. Um, I think what you're seeing as of late is kind of an increased focus on, you know, building a Navy platform. They're transitioning from commercial shipbuilding in, into the military shipbuilding, sir. Sure, and I, I suppose I could have prefaced that with, I was, I was speaking more specifically on the, uh, on the military shipbuilding. Uh, when, when, just just approximately, I mean, did they, did they, did they catch us on the military side five years ago? Was it 10 years ago? When did? Yeah, let me, I would have to go probably do, you know, um, I mean, they've, they've really, from my assessment, really kind of in the last five to 10 years, they've, they've really mm -hmm. turned the corner on their, on their military shipbuilding. You know, I don't know that their, their processes and their, and their capabilities, quite frankly, are, are better than ours. In fact, I would say they're not. 
Um, you know, I think uh, what we do inside our public shipyards, uh, there is no other no other group of shipyards in the world that maintains nuclear ships like we do, okay? Yes. Um, so we have a, tr a tremendous capability. What we need to do is get better at how we use that capability. So I'll yes, turn sir. it Admiral Marcos. They, 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 don't, they don't have any, I, I do not believe they have anywhere near the quality that we have. Um, I, I do worry about their ability to, to pump out quantity and quantity, um, you know, someone becomes a quality in, in and of itself uh, when, when, you're in a, when you're in a fight. Uh, I, I, I do, if I can mention something for, for you and for the, the members, uh, Admiral Fowler the other day testified that communist China's money laundering is the number one source of illicit funds for, um, the transnational criminal organizations. It was the first time that I'd heard somebody at, at Admiral Fowler's level, call it out publicly like that in a hearing. And then general Townsend a week later called out China for, uh, the illegal fishing off of the coast of Africa and the damage that it was doing and the widespread hunger that it had the potential to create inside of um, in, inside of that continent and several countries in that continent and the potential civil unrest. Um, you guys, you, you guys know that the China fight would be a, a naval fight. I mean, what, what's your assessment of China's uh, activity in the Taiwan area and um, and the illegal fishing. Yeah, sir, I, I really appreciate the question. I'm not sure I'm in a, in a position to give you a, a real good answer there, um, but we could certainly take a, a question and, and uh, get back with you on that one, sir. All right. Well, I know that wasn't the subject of the meeting, but it, it, it's, I picked up very clearly that uh, some extremely high ranking um, military leaders that I very, very long trusted are now speaking uh, publicly about things that we used to say behind closed doors. And I picked up on the G7 coming together to effectively uh, caution China on uh, any action against Taiwan. And I worry about our dependence on uh, not just chips, but other things similar to what we would consider to be a semiconductor or an optical chip and, and dependence on uh, companies in other countries to manufacture those that we have to have in all of our computer systems, whether it be an aircraft or, or, a, or a naval vessel. With that, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you for what y'all do. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. I want to bring to your attention, I think the other committee members probably know it also, uh, we have been working on trying to energize the American shipbuilding industry using the uh, export of natural gas and uh, petroleum products that that be on American built ships. Uh, we do know that the American shipbuilding industry has atrophied and, and basically given the commercial market to Japan, uh, Korea and China. And in that we have lost a great deal of our capacity upon which the Navy would depend not only for the ongoing repair, but for uh, ships that uh, we would need in, uh, to get to uh, 350 or even more. So uh, it's a, um, an issue that goes beyond just the naval ships, it goes to the commercial ships. Similarly, the Jones Act plays into this and the ability of the shipyards. My final point, uh, I guess for all of us and uh, admirals for your uh, awareness and uh, pushback to us uh, is that uh, there, the shipyards are going to, the privately owned shipyards are going to need to be upgraded, capital upgrades, uh, particularly the smaller ones that will, that could provide additional services. Uh, and I would like to have uh, from you, Admiral Galenius, the um, estimate of smaller private shipyards that you would intend to contract with for certain kinds of repairs. I want to feed that back into the issue that was raised earlier by one of our colleagues about the um, infrastructure bill. Okay, Ms. Lurie, it is your turn. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, in the first round, I discussed the class maintenance plan for the Virginia class submarine, but I'd like to shift to surface ships uh, for the second round. Um, many people use the term legacy platforms to describe anything that they want to get rid of. And I found that it's interesting 
today that people are using the term legacy platform for ships that are not even 10 years old, like the LCS, the first four in the class. And they're also applying it to the Ticonderoga class cruisers, which still have you know, usable service life remaining. Um, I served as the XO on USS Anzio, so I understand it, it costs more and it's difficult to maintain these ships. Um, but global presence matters, even if the presence isn't the latest shiny object. Um, and divesting of these platforms today, while their replacement is nothing more than a concept in the future, I don't think it's prudent. And as we know, both the outgoing and incoming Indo-PACOM commanders um, testified recently to the Senate that China could make an offensive move on Taiwan in the next six years. Um, so it's curious to me why we'd suggest getting rid of these platforms uh, without a replacement. So I think the Navy needs to look at today, Battle Force 2025, uh, before we can truly talk about Battle Force 2045. Um, so just some information that, that I would like to know, um, Admiral Galinas, if you could provide the committee um, the amount of funds over the fit up that it would be required to maintain the 11 cruisers and the first four LCS um, that the Navy is proposing to decommission in the Battle Force 2045. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, we'll take that question and we'll get a more detailed answer uh, that I could provide you in this setting. But uh, I understand the question. I think it's a fair one and we'll we'll get you that information. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. I look forward to that. And um, next, to sort of pivoting back to the CBO report that I discussed uh, during the first round of questions, it has a really interesting chart in there where it compares workload versus the workforce. Um, so, if you look back to when we had 8 nuclear capable shipyards, um, the workforce exceeded the workload capacity by about 10%. And then we were reduced to 4 nuclear shipyards and the workforce and local workload were balanced for about 5 years. And however, as we decommission conventional carriers, um, the workload exceeds the workforce in every year. And then the CBO report, it forecasts out that even with the full implementation of the SIOP, that workload will exceed workforce capacity in 25 of the next 30 years. Um, and I think that's not even taking into account the ships that we plan to build the additional submarines out for 2045. Um, it's clear that the public shipyards will not be able to uh, maintain um, the pace of that maintenance. Um, so Admiral Galinas, in your assessment, uh, with such an ambitious plan as Battle Force 2045 and the number of submarines we plan to build, do you feel like it's time to invest in another nuclear capable shipyard? Yes, ma'am. I, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, I would tell you at, at this point, um, and it, it has to go. I'll go back to the 15-year maintenance plan that we're working on right now. Um, I will tell you that that submarine maintenance is probably my number one priority right now, and how we execute that, especially as we get out into the late 20s and into the early 30s. Okay, when we start, you know, we're gonna, as you well know, you know, based on the. Uh, on the, on the ship construction plan, we're, we're going to go through a little bit of a valley here over the next few years, but then it, it quickly ramps up in the late 20s and into the 30s. And, uh, and our ability to, uh, to be able to support that fleet and to, uh, you know, what we're doing right now with the, the PSYOP effort um, and, and the naval ship, um, the naval sustainment system work uh, to, to really kind of buy back that productive capacity and then lay over the 15 year plan to determine do we have the capacity within the the public yards, and then how much would we outsource to the private yards? Um, that would probably better inform that type of a discussion, and I'm happy to uh, to have that with you when, when we get that analysis completed. Well, thank you. And just we have a minute remaining, so I just wanted to point out that, you know, the one thing I hear the most frequently um, in my visits across the waterfront here in Hampton Roads, you know, one quarter of all the shipbuilding and repair in the country happens here, and, and you've referenced um, the importance of the, the region for maintaining the Navy. Readiness, um, you know, the, it's level loading. It's level loading of the port um, so that there can be predictability um, so that our partners and the private shipyards can make the investment and their infrastructure and their workforce. And so I went and visited the Gettysburg and the Vicksburg uh, recently. Um, and, you know, here we are, you know, it's, it's shocking when they've made investments um, in the work that is coming down the pipeline to modernize the cruisers. Yet all of a sudden, a plan comes out now that shows yet more unpredictability that, you know, we might decommission 10 or 11 of these cruisers. And, you know, every time that happens, it's 600, 800, maybe more workers across the waterfront who are laid off. And those are skills that are difficult to replace. So, you know, just, just making a point of, of what I'm hearing the most from, from the waterfront here and our private partners. And I know my time has expired, so I'll yield back. I would just say, ma'am, I, I appreciate that comment. And I get the same thing when we interface with, with industry. And as Admiral Verhaeg pointed out, you know, that stable and predictable workload, um, 
I think we owe industry that plan. So I thank you for those comments. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Leary. Uh, the we're, we're definitely going to have a uh, roundtable uh, with the uh, private shipyard uh, owners or, and to discuss a range of issues, uh, some of which have already been mentioned here. Certainly the scheduling is an issue, uh, what kind of repairs need to be done, all of those things. Uh, and uh, Admos will invite you to that. It'll have to be an informal hearing just because of the scheduling. I believe we now have Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks again to you and your staff for the generosity of letting me participate. Um, Admiral, I, I, I worry a bit, and maybe it's just after this last year, I, I worry that the sands of the hourglass could run out before we've had a chance to shore up the infrastructure at our, our shipyards. You know, what we've learned over the past year is that anything can happen, and it's certainly possible that a natural disaster could strike one of the shipyards at any moment and render it or a, or a crucial portion of it unusable. I touch wood every day that a seismic event doesn't happen here in our neck of the woods. So has the has the PSYOP program office built any contingency plans into the PSYOP in the event that a natural disaster occurs? Or would the program office need to kind of go back to the drawing board and completely rework uh, the plan? I, I realize we can't plan for every possible scenario, but I'm, I'm just curious to know what level of preparation has been completed in case a shipyard experiences an unexpected uh, catastrophe. Yes, sir. No, I, I appreciate that question. I think that's a fair one. Um, you know, and, and it's especially pertinent up in the in the northwest, as you indicated. You know, I, I think our 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 near term opportunities to accelerate, as I mentioned earlier, uh, are on the design and the in the planning piece. And and you know, we we've got to get that work done. Um, and then you know, from there we can advance into the into the actual construction and execution stage. Um, you know, that work is is ongoing. Uh, the, the the execution work, the production work, is ongoing, as you well know. Up in Portsmouth, they're they're well along. Um, we've got some fairly significant projects going on uh, down in Norfolk right now. Um, we're we're working through we're uh, working through the planning piece out in Pearl to be able to uh, you know to start uh, in the 23 time frame the uh, the dry dock in in Pearl, the new dry dock out there. Um, and I, I will tell you, we're we're going through right now. Um, you know what happens in dry dock six up there in. Uh, and, and Puget and how that, that planning piece comes out, plays out. So, you know, of the three dry docks that we're actually building new, if you will, in Portsmouth, Pearl and Puget, you know, that's probably the third in line at this point uh, based on the current plan that we have. Um, you know, if there is opportunities to accelerate that, because I will tell you, um, as you well mentioned, you know, there, there is concern about the dry dock up there and, and the seismic, uh, you know, um, safety of it and, and, and you know, uh, how, because it was designed and built prior to the current uh, seismic requirements that are in place in, in your part of the country, sir. Over. I want to touch on one other subject, but quickly, yeah. the, the, I guess I was trying to get at, are there contingency plans in place if there is a disaster, or does the SIOP program office just have to go back to the drawing board? Yeah, we, we have not really planned. And, 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 either Puget or any place else. Right, right. No, I, I mean, I can't say that's part of our plan. We, we would have to, uh, we would readjust. I, I, I liken it to a uh, kind of a ship construction contract when we have a, a major hurricane, for example, um, you know, and, and think about, uh, you know, when Katrina hit the Gulf Coast several years ago, and, and I was involved in that with our uh, 